it's overwhelming, but it's also our jobs. Mm -hmm. Our job is only going to get harder. It's worrisome. And this is something that's unprecedented. Now is not the time to be a cowboy. No one has anything to prove. We're all in this together. Welcome to Reporting from the Front Lines of a Pandemic. I'm Kristen Bullier, and I spoke with Kiana Francis, an associate producer at WJAR Station in Providence. It hasn't even been a year since Kiana graduated, and she's already working a newsroom in the midst of a pandemic. Here's what she had to say. Okay, so I'm an associate producer. So basically what that means is I train on most, if not all, of the shows at the station, so that is somewhat you know, it's all sick, then I can cover that for them. Um, but if there's, if everyone's still working, what I do is I help other producers, whatever they need help with. If they want me to write a script, I write a script. If they need me to cut video, I cut video. If they need me to make graphics, I make graphics. When I first started working, my shift was more of like an 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. deal. So I would help with the 12 to six o'clock shows so if they needed me to do anything with that I would do that or if they need me to run prompter I would run prompter cut video things like that more recently um I was actually training on the what was it the sunrise shows during the week which are shows from 4 30 to 4 35 5 36 so 4 30 to 7 basically their shows and I was training on those and then I had to cover that. Um, but that was like the week that Governor Raimondo was like, if you travel outside of the state, then you have to quarantine for two weeks. And I was covering someone who was traveling outside of the country. So then and I went from covering Sunrise for one week to covering Sunrise for about three to four weeks. And then I went from doing that to doing associate producer overnight and then producing the weekend morning shows. So basically what an associate producer does, that was my long-winded way of saying, if you need me to cover a shift or a show for some reason, if someone can't do anything, or if you need help, then that's what the associate producers do. We just train to be producers, and when producers are gone, then we cover for them. And that's something that I've been doing a lot recently since this whole coronavirus thing has happened. My schedule has been a little crazy with all the moving shifts and stuff. So it's been a lot of you're a jack of all trades and you kind of fill in the slots for someone who is unavailable that day or if, yeah. if extra help is needed. And um, yeah. And then I, your overall goal, I would assume, is one day you want to, you hope to be a producer. Yeah, that's my goal. Actually, I, I sort of switched gears from more multimedia journalism to wanting to be a producer junior year. Um, which is kind of late, but that's what I was like, you know what, I really like this and I want to do that. So I'm super blessed and grateful that I was able to get a job as an associate producer because it's just one step closer to me doing what I really, really, really enjoy doing. Um, it's difficult. It's a lot of work. It could be stressful at times, like any job, but it's something that I really, really enjoy. Um, and I'm just, I'm super blessed that I'm able to to already be doing that. Um, and to train to make that a more full-time producer position sometime in the future. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of responsibilities on your plate right now, but it also sounds like you're getting a lot of work experience. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, so how have you had to, I know that you spoke a little bit just now about how you were covering someone or mm -hmm. you were covering a topic that wasn't in this state and that you couldn't, so much do that anymore because of the laws that were put in place okay so yeah basically with that i guess the, the first big change that we really experienced that i would say affected work life since the coronavirus was a new i guess bill order mandate whatever you want to call it if you travel outside of the united states come back to Rhode Island, you need to quarantine yourself for two weeks. The week that that happened, I was covering the morning shows for someone else who was traveling. They were using their vacation time. 
So it went from me covering this person's shift or producing that show for a week to me producing that show for three or four weeks because that person had to self-quarantine once they came back from vacation. And that was like the first, I guess, effect that I felt of it was your schedule can change like this. And I, I still don't have a normal schedule since. Unfortunately, someone at WJR did contract the coronavirus. They're fine. They're fully recovered now. Um, but while they were gone, they had to switch schedules around. And then I ended up producing for the morning shows on the weekends. And that was, I'm not really sure how long that was supposed to last, but I've been doing it for maybe three weeks. And I just got my schedule until the end of May. And I'm going to keep doing that until the end of May. Um, so it's not really, I'm not really sure what a normal schedule is at this point because there's so many things that are always constantly changing for everyone. There's some people who are producing from home. The whole sales department is, is at home. The whole web team is at home. The office is very spaced out now. You have to wear masks inside at work, which is just, I think, the weirdest thing. Um, even in the control room, the directors and the producers are split apart. So basically every aspect of work life has been affected for everyone um, because of the virus. And I don't know if anyone expected this to last for this long, uh, but it has been. And we're, we're continuing to work through it, but it's been a little difficult trying to, trying to keep up with everything. So um, with your schedule changing and with you taking the roles of people for a lot longer, you filling in the spots for people who maybe went on vacation or who maybe mm -hmm. left the state and now have to self-quarantine, what do you feel like you're benefiting most out of this different work experience for you? Definitely experience. Uh, definitely <laughs> You, you you learn to roll with the punches. You really do. My first week working the weekend morning shift, I was like, the biggest thing that I'm going to have to deal with is that one, I'm by myself. And two, we have so much coronavirus news. No one's here. What do I do? I thought that that was going to be the biggest thing is trying to find what coronavirus news should be in the show or what shouldn't and all that stuff. And then on my first day, there was an eight alarm fire. I didn't even know that there could be an eight alarm fire. And basically I was there by myself and then the whole team had to come in. It was an, one executive producer and then another one and then an assignment desk person. And then we had to wake up a reporter out of his sleep at like 3 a.m. to go cover this thing for a show at 6 a.m. It was the, it was like the most intense first day, I think, ever. Um, and I think that that was like a, a decent wake up call to basically anything can happen. Um, so the biggest thing that I've took away from that and what I keep taking away is just this job really just like keeps you on your toes. Even if you think you just have to focus on one thing, there's always something else that you're going to have to keep your ears and eyes out for. And learning how to adapt to that is really what builds your strengths and makes you better at your job whether you're an associate producer, an executive producer, a reporter, whatever, this time I really think has strengthened people's skills in whatever role that they take or whatever roles that they didn't traditionally take, but they're forced to take because of all these new like precautions and regulations. People have really learned to, to think on their feet and be able to, to pass on that information to people in a way that's like they understand, but it's not like so panicky. And I think trying to find that balance has been super important and really eye opening. Um, so when did you start working at WJAR? I started here on July twenty second. Okay. I think so. A couple, uh, just a couple months after graduation, I started here. That's awesome. Yeah. Um. So it hasn't even been a year yet that no. you have <laughs> no, been in this to. industry and you are already working in a times of a pandemic. And yes. I know that you are saying that you always have to be on your toes, especially with a job like yours. You always have to be having your eyes and ears out for the next thing happening. Um, and it sounds to me like you have a very, your schedule's always changing. You don't have a set schedule. You don't you can assume that you have Mondays and Tuesdays off, but can you really be sure? Exactly. I think that is one of the hardest parts recently because, as I said, I started on an 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. schedule. And in my mind, I was like, oh, that'll probably have to change if I have to 
or by someone shift or have to train on an earlier show, but 11 to 7 will be my schedule. I'll be fine. And then a couple months in, found out that is not the case before all this coronavirus stuff. It's schedules are constantly changing all the time. I was at one point, I was 3 to 11 for a couple months. And then I was doing a new shift every week. And now I'm doing overnight. Um, so it's sort of hard. Your body's probably just like, oh my God. Please to sleep at one specific time for more than a week. Um, but yeah, you really don't know what's going to happen. You really don't know when your shift is. I know what my shift is until next month, until the end of the month. And that's all that I can assume so far. But it's constantly changing. It could be, it, I can think that my shift next week is on Wednesdays through Sundays. And then something happens and then they have to change it to, I don't know, Saturdays through Thursdays. I don't know. Um, so that's just something that you have to be prepared for. And it's never fun not knowing your schedule is and working overnight. It's just like your body doesn't know what to do with itself. Um, but it is something that you have to learn how to quickly adapt. So you have to like find little tricks for yourself to try to get some sleep and make sure that you're not forgetting to eat. Because although that sounds like super like, yeah, how am I going to forget to eat? It could really like put a toll on you. There's a time that I was only eating once a day. And sometimes I still do. And it's like, oh, shoot, I have to leave. Let me have like a piece of bread before I leave the house. And that's all I eat for 24 hours. So the job itself is is already difficult when it comes to that. But you have to remember in every situation to take care of yourself. Because you cannot do a job well enough if you're not taking care of yourself. Not something that I'm still constantly learning to do is I can't give my all if I'm neglecting myself. And I think that that's something that's common between a lot of people is learning how to balance work with with uh, self-care. It was just like basic things like eating or washing your face or like sleeping for more than four hours at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that kind of ties a little bit into what my next question was going to be for you. Um, With everything going on with the pandemic and with your crazy schedule, are you able to or have you been finding stress relievers, things that you enjoy that you're still able to do to kind of, how are you coping with the stress to kind of escape from Um, everything that you're covering right now? Super candid and honest. For a while, it was just like, at first, it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to get to. And it was always like, all I have to do is get to this day, and then I have a weekend. Or all I have to do is get to this, and then I have a day to rest. And I'll, just looking forward to that it used to help me cope for a little while. And then after that, it's just like, it just feels like you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And sometimes it gets to be too much. Um, what I started to do recently is just like, just stepping outside. Because on the weekends, all I really did, because I was so tired, I would sleep for like 12 hours and just don't do anything else. But just going outside once, like this morning, I woke up at like 5 a.m., which is the latest I've woken up in a long time. Mm -hmm. I woke up at 5 a.m. and I made some soup and I just went outside and I just ate soup at 5 a.m. on my porch. (laughs) And it sounds like kind of crazy and weird. But it, it made me so happy. Like, it was rainy, and I was in my coat, and I was eating something warm, and I was outside, and I wasn't looking at these four walls or a computer screen, which is what I constantly i am either on this computer or on my computer at work or looking at some sort of screen, and just, like, breathing actual fresh air and just, like, feeling that I'm actually a person and not a machine that's just constantly working. I That, to me, I... It sounds just so weird and simple and kind of like I'm an old person, <laughs> but it makes me so genuinely happy to just be able to go outside and breathe, even if it's just for 10 minutes to anywhere to an hour. I only started doing that last week because every week before that, I would just like end the week and crash. And then sometimes I'd be like, I can't do this. Like there, there have been countless times of just like, I'm so tired I can't I don't know how to do this like this is such like harrowing news all the time and you're you're drained physically you're drained mentally you're just like I I don't know what to do um but trying to find ways to cope even if it's just even if you don't go on a walk maybe you don't like walks just like go outside for a second or talk to your friends that you haven't talked to in a while or if you want to I don't know do a skincare treatment I don't know, um, but ju- I just find that 
going outside at, at all. Just like feel if it's hot, feel if it's cold, if it's raining, just so I can feel like a person again. Um, that's that was a very long winded answer of saying just going outside and doing whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's it's, super helpful. It sounds like something that you probably have to think about a lot even before yeah. everything started happening with the pandemic now more than ever. Um, but with a schedule like yours and with a job like yours right now, it sounds like something that you had to overcome even before this. Um, a little bit, because, you know, if you don't know some, if you're in a place where you don't really know people, you try to, even if you don't go out to like, I don't know, restaurants or bars or something, it's nice to just get outside once in a while, take a walk or something, um, which I would do sort of infrequently whenever I felt like it. Um, so I guess it's something that you should do, period, is learn how to, to do things that make you happy. But I think especially now is taking an even bigger toll on me because of all the things that you see every day, um, which could be sometimes super sad and then sometimes really, really encouraging. Or it could be physically exhausting because you have to work long hours or you have to work overnight to work a schedule that you haven't worked before. Um, or just, you know, sometimes you have bad days. Uh, and I think just finding something that helps you cope in a healthy way uh, or something that makes you genuinely happy is super, super important. Yes, obviously during the pandemic, because there's so much going around and so many people are just like unsure of what to do, but just in general, because there are always many times where some, it feels like too much. Uh, and I think that for those points, you have to already have something in your arsenal that you know, this is, this usually makes me feel better. I'm going to try to do this or if I feel like this, I know to stay away from this and to go towards that. And this is trying, this is sort of helping me find that so that when this is all over, if this is all over, mm -hmm. you can still have those little tricks in your back pocket, even for like an off day or something. I hope we can have our summer at one point or another. <laughs> uh, it may be summer 2021, but it'll be summer. Hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really hoping, Kiana. I'm, I, I, I hope so too. I'm trying to buy a ticket to go home yeah. <laughs> for this summer. So uh, I just hope that I can, you know, Do that. see my family because I haven't seen them in a long time. So. Um, so now that we're on the topic of St. Thomas and your home and where you're from originally, um, when the hurricane hit your um, island mm -hmm. a few years ago, mm -hmm. you had food drives and you had donation boxes around campus um, yes. to try to bring goods back to home where you're from. Yes. Um, both a hurricane and a pandemic, they're very devastating, but they're both very different. Yeah. I don't know if you can kind of compare and contrast right now what's happening right now to everything that you went through a few years ago i think the first thing that i think of when you ask that is something that is the same it's sort of like a feeling of hopelessness for a second like when the hurricanes hit i was here my mom was here with me she was helping me move into my apartment so i was super thankful that she was affected by that there's the same thing of what what happens now when she goes home. Will she have a job? Same thing happening now. When this is still over, will all these people who've lost their jobs have jobs? Will I have a house? How can I afford to, to get that together? Are my finances going to look? When I go home, is there going to be anything left for me? What about food? What about my friends? What about my family? What about I can't because I, I couldn't go home and visit them, obviously, because everything was destroyed and it wasn't safe. Um, and I think that there's a commonality between the people that you care about being constantly on your mind. I want to visit them, but I, I know that it's best for them and for myself if I stay where I am and help from where I am. And I think that that's super important to think about 
have is that I know that you know, people want to go outside. I know that people want to try to to help and go outside and, and I don't know, do drives or something, which can be super helpful. But I do understand that sometimes the best thing that you can do is stay where you are. And that's being helpful enough. Because when the hurricanes hit, I was ready to go home. I was ready to buy a plane ticket home. I was ready to, to drop out of school, basically, to go home to help. Um, because that's the place that I know. That's the that's where I was born and raised. I lived there for 17 years of my life. And most of the people that I love are still there. So I was willing to drop everything to help other people. When you think about it, if I went down there, I would be taking away valuable resources from people who actually needed those resources. Instead of giving, I would be taking away. If there's limited water, I would be taking limited water. If there was limited resources, I would be taking limited resources, food, whatever. It would just be one more person to take care of. And I think that that's the same situation here. A lot of people want to get back to work because I understand the finance. I'm still blessed enough to be able to work, but a lot of people are not. And I know that the financial burden is really hard on that. And to completely dismiss that would just be so wrong of me. But if you were to just go back to work right now or to go back to a hair salon or go back to a restaurant and and do all the things that you did to make you feel normal and because that's the things you're used to, then you could be doing more harm than good. But staying inside is protecting yourself and it's protecting the people around you. And I know it's hard to come to terms with, but there are a lot of things that you can try to do from home to help other people. And then after the phase of, of helplessness, is like you realize what those things are. I decided after months of like, after weeks of my mom trying to talk me down from going back home, I was like, I'll start a drive with Emerson. So I just basically sent out a mass email to Lee Pelton and every single administrator at Emerson that I could find on the on their website. Every single one, I just put them all in an email, sent it out. This is what I want to do. This is what happened. I lived here all my life. I want to help. I can't be there. Please help me help them. And then you can find the same thing here too. There are a lot of people who are making masks from home. There are a lot of uh, big businesses like Hasbro um, that's reutilizing a lot of their their facilities to make to make face shields for people. There are people in their houses that are like, "Oh, I have all this extra fabric. Let me make masks for people." There are people who are starting drives. There are people who are volunteering at food services. There's so many people. That are just like, I understand that this is devastating. I want to help. And I know I need to stay inside. How do I combine those two things? And then they figure out, figure it out and use their skills and their talents to actually help people without actually going into harm's way. And I think that that is just something that is tr just such a beautiful thing to do mm -hmm. during this time. Because tragedy is always super, super hard to deal with, whether it's it's a natural disaster or a pandemic. And something that's super common is first the devastation. And then it's like, you come to terms with, okay, this is what's happening right now. This is how I can help with while keeping myself safe and while keeping others safe as well. And I would say that those two are the things that are the most similar um, about trying to help people during the hurricane and trying to help people. And, um, well, I'm happy that you ended up, you know, not leaving school and you stayed in school <laughs> and now look at where you are now. Um, there's a reason for everything. Um, but it really does sound like your experiences with everything that happened in St. Thomas to everything that's happening now. Um, in, in the end, it, it was dev very devastating for you and your family. Um, but overall at the end of it, you know, you can look back at it and it sounds like you really um, were able to, to learn some really hard life lessons out of it, but it's making what you do now, I would hope, a little bit fami more familiar, I guess. Yeah, I definitely try to be more understanding, like, I, because you sort of understand when you see, like, with the hurricanes, you see all the damage. And you see, this is the amount of people that are dead. This is the amount of people that are missing. 
these are all the homes that are destroyed. This, these are all the people that are homeless. And it's just like, it's so harrowing to see that. And it, it gets to be a lot. So when you kind of do these shows with that sort of perspective, it's like, yes, you have to know how many people this is affected. You have to know that that's something that you need to know. But here are also all the good things that are happening. That's why with WJR, like there's a segment, show us something good. And I just think that people, you cannot hide all of the things that are happening and how this is impacting people because people need to understand how serious that is. But just constantly bombarding them with only bad news is just like, it takes the toll that I don't think I would want anyone else to have. It's just thinking about all of like the damage and thinking about all the people that I love that were left without homes and people that I know that have died because of that. Just thinking about that constant, like even now, it makes me super emotional. So trying to, to mix all of that with actual positive things related to the coronavirus, like, yes, this is what's happening. But here's what this thing is doing. Like yesterday in the show, it's like there's a bunch of kids in Massachusetts, just all these little children making face shields for people with 3D printers. And I was like, this is so cute. And then even if they don't have three 3D printers, they're going up, they're like acting as liaisons to hospitals. There was a nine-year-old who was acting as a liaison to a hospital. And I was like, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. And it's just like, it's so, it's so good to know that even in this time of so much disaster, that there are people, even children, who are willing to reach out. And I try to do my best to include the good with the bad, because people need to understand both sides. And they need to have a little bit of, like a glimmer of hope so that they don't always just be in the situation. But they also need to understand how serious serious the situation is. And going through, I think going through that hurricane, it makes me empathize more with, you know, families who are affected and both sides of the, the situation. Like people need to, people feel like they need to get back to work, but also the healthcare system is overwhelmed um, because of all these people with all these cases. We are able to empathize with people more, but understand that, Yes, this is important, but people's lives are on the line. And at the end of the day, lives, you can't replace that. Um, so I think that under going through what I went through helps me understand more why it's so important to do everything that we can to keep not only ourselves, but to keep other people safe as well. And to try to convey that in a way that is easy to understand easy for people to comprehend and try to provide some comfort to people who are feeling extremely anxious about how can I put food on the table versus I'm affected by the coronavirus. What can I do now? I try to find that balance. Mm-hmm. That sense. So with the times like this, I know we've been talking a little bit about how a time like this can be very hectic. It can be a little intimidating. Um, I know that you were lucky enough to be able to land a job not too far after you graduated. Um, That doesn't necessarily happen for everyone. Um, And so I was wondering what words of advice you could give um, as a recent graduate yourself to um, some of my peers, some of my classmates, um, anyone who is a soon-to-be graduate Um, interested in going into journalism, whether it's producing, whether it's broadcast um, at a time like this or just in general? Um, Well, I know you've probably heard this and you've probably heard this a trillion times before, but stop comparing yourself to other people. I'm going to look directly in the camera. Stop comparing yourself to other people. I did that even before I graduated, when I'm graduate, like after I graduated, during graduation, I was like, how am I going to get a job? There are so many people in this school who are so much better at what at doing what I want to do than I am. But you have to trust the time and effort that you put into this school. You did not make it. Like, Marsha's practicum class is hard. It is so difficult. And you guys are doing this when you're not even on campus. You guys are making a special based on all the circumstances around you, which is exactly what you're going to have to do in the real world. You're already doing it. 
So stop comparing yourself to other people. Stop it. I see you're doing it and stop. <laughs> um, that's the first thing. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, and the second thing is I know, or I, I, I actually can't start to fathom how it must feel to work so hard for four years and not be able to walk across the stage because that's just something that me personally I look forward to that's something that I know my mom looked forward to um because Emerson is very hard work so it's not cheap um so just walking across the stage you're like wow I did this like you feel a sense of like pride and gratification and I know that for a lot of people it's like it's super hard that you may not be able to do that and I can't even begin to understand that but I just don't put all the pressure on that because graduation or no graduation, you guys work extremely hard to be where you are right now. You guys have learned so many things and you guys are absolutely ready to work in the And if you apply to a job for months and months and months <laughs> and you don't get a response, that, that, that may not even have to do with like, am I good enough or am I not good enough? It might just have to do with, hey, we're in a pandemic and <laughs> people are kind of stressed. People may be looking for more reporters or more producers or people may not have time to do that. And sometimes seeing your peers get jobs and you're not getting a job in time, it's like, what did I do wrong? And it might not be anything. It's just everyone's journey is different. So that's how maybe it sound like kind of like hippie-ish. I don't know. But everyone is taking a, a different journey than everyone else. Um, and your pace may not be the same as someone else's. You may get a job a little after someone. You may get a job before someone, and you may be like, did I deserve to get this job over someone else? Or what did I do to not get this position that I wanted? Um, and that, that just doesn't necessarily mean that you're not good enough or qualified enough. It's just like maybe that position I applied to, I don't know how many jobs. I applied to so many. I think I was applying to at least five jobs a day for maybe a month straight. Wow. Month, month and a half. Um, and I either didn't hear from any of them or I got rejected from almost all of them before I found this job. And I found it relatively quickly. But that doesn't mean, like, this was the first job I applied to, and I just got there, and then that's it. No, I was, you know, working every single day. And at that point, we still, my mom still didn't have internet in her house because of the, the hurricanes. It was a whole thing. And even though it was, like, a year and a half later, she still didn't have internet. So I went to her job every day, and I hid in, like, this room that they don't use anymore. And I was just, like, trying to do my best to apply to all these jobs, do what I can, even if I didn't have, like, the resources to do so. Um, and I worked super hard <laughs> to get all my applications out to people. And sometimes, you know, you get rejected by jobs that you think that you're the perfect for. And then one day, the job, something comes along and you're like, this seems interesting. I wonder how it goes. And then nine months later, here you are. That's, that's basically um, what happened. So my only advice could really be don't compare yourself to others in terms of your skill level or in terms of a timetable because everyone works at their own pace you guys are all they're equally talented at different things i'm assuming i haven't met any of you but i have been to emerson so i think i i, I could feel pretty confident think that you guys won't have much issues um you just have to be able to trust yourself trust the things that you've learned and and trust the process and it's gonna happen at different rates and you may feel defeated, but you shouldn't wallow in that feeling too much. It's okay to feel it. It's okay to maybe be disappointed every once in a while, but you gotta, you gotta keep going. You gotta keep pushing for it because you work too hard to not get what you want to get. Um, yeah, so that's my advice. Yeah, and those words are very relatable. You know, a lot of what you said are things that maybe I have thought myself and you think, I'm the only one that feels like this. Yeah. you know like yeah. this yeah. person is way better than I am at this and this person is way more suitable and this person knows mm -hmm. a lot more about editing and technology than I might and you get oh, in your own lot. head and you start to feel mm -hmm. am I the only person who feels like this yeah so definitely felt that a lot my senior year was like I don't even 
It was second semester senior year. I was like, I haven't applied to a single job. Not one. Not one. How can I do that when I know that all these people are so much better than me at this? How can I in good conscience apply? And it's like, that's so dumb. That's so stupid. Like, you are so good at what you do because you made it this far. So for you to make it this far and be like, ah, you know what? I'm not even going to bother applying because why? Because all these people are so much better than me. You just need to get out of your own head. And that's just me talking to my past self because I'm just like, girl, get it together. Stop, yeah. stop hitting yourself. Literally get up off the office. Literally just get up off your butt and start applying. You work too hard to not get a job. Are you kidding? Um, so just like trying to whip yourself into shape. Basically, if you find yourself pitying, like, what was wrong with you? Get it together. <laughs> Again, I'm Kristen Bollier, and I spoke with Kiana Francis, associate producer at WJAR. I would like to thank Kiana again for taking the time out of her busy schedule to do this interview with me, and I would like to thank all of you for watching this episode of Reporting from the Frontline of a Pandemic.